So the next speaker is Jane Efferman. Efferman, Jane, hello. So uh, please come. Jane is from is a co-director of the Disease Modeling Center at uh, York University. So, welcome. Thank you, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming this morning, and thank you to the Royal Society for giving me this chance to speak about my work. Um, so I'm going to speak about what math has to do with COVID-19. And in fact, um, the association between mathematics and biology and the health sciences um, is not something that many people um, before COVID-19 recognized. Um, uh, statistics has uh, certainly been something that people have been able to associate with biology and with health um, for a very long time, uh, especially since uh, Bernoulli used it to um, uh, get people to go get smallpox vaccinations. John Snow used uh, statistical models and uh, centroids to cap a, a cholera affected well in London. Um, Semmelweis used statistics to help control purple fever in obstetrics wards in Austria. And Ronald Ross used statistics and simple mathematical models in his uh, Nobel Prize winning research to look at the control of malaria and the control of the interactions of mosquitoes and humans in malaria affected countries. It was in the 1920s that Kermack and McKendrick developed this model called the SIR model. And this is based on a simple system of differential equations that tracks how populations uh, with specific disease status change over time. And so what we have is we have susceptibles who are susceptible to, to disease when they have interactions, which is like multiplication here, um, with infecteds, then they become infected. And then our infecteds can be removed from the infected population by either uh, recovery or death. Um, so what's important about this very um, seminal work from the 1920s is that we, we then began to be able to see how to use systems of differential equations that uh, look at slope and area under the curve to be able to quantify what the effects of infectious diseases were going to be in a population. And so if you look at the differential equations, of course, you've got slope. That's a derivative from calculus. And area under the curve is using integration. So two very simple things that we, we use. But you can see here in this, in this SIR model, we're ignoring so many characteristics of the population and health status. And so we could incorporate treatment. We can incorporate vaccination into this model. We can incorporate waning immunity, where your immunity can decay over time. We incorporate age, immune system status, ethnicity, um, sex, and so on. So this model can, be get, can get a lot more complex over time. So when we want to really also understand immunity in an individual, then we can use this model developed in the 1990s, co-developed by Alan Perelson and Martin Novak, called the TIV model, which tracks how infectious diseases can infect the body um, and then can be used to extrapolate measurements of the immune response. And so here we have the TIV model, where we have target cells that are infected by pathogen, uh, which is V here for virus, and they become infected cells. And those infected cells then produce new pathogen uh, that then goes into the body to infect more cells. Uh, and this model was developed uh, in reaction to study to uh, HIV patients to really understand what's, what's going on in individuals and, and how to develop biopharmaceuticals um, and in future for influenza and other diseases, how to um, develop vaccines that are going to positively affect the immune response. So, but that model doesn't incorporate all different measurements of the immune system. So I'm interested in expanding these models to really look at key questions to do with the immune response. And so that means that I have to have mathematical models that look at immunity generation in, in, in individuals from infection and from vaccination and try to quantify their protection that they're going to have against future exposures of the pathogen, but also try to quantify how sick someone will feel, what their symptoms will be like, because that's going to affect their transmissibility into the population as well, because it affects their behavior and their, and their pathogen load. 
So we also do this for vaccination. When we're trying to translate susceptibility and transmissibility from the immune response at the population level, then we need to also take into consideration how individuals behave and how they make decisions at the population level. So we incorporate game theory and behavior into our models to determine when people were, are going to be more likely to mask or get vaccinated and what the trade-offs and costs are for different people of different genders, sex, ethnicities, um, uh, vocations, where, where they work, and where they live. And so, of course, we're also interested in tracking how immune, uh, how diseases move around the world, but I'm also really interested in tracking how immune systems move around the world so that we can quantify what the distribution of immunity looks like in populations. And so this means that we also have to keep track of immigration and emigration rates because you would think that the immunity distributions in a city like Toronto would be quite different from the immunity dis distribution uh, in a city like Calgary. So during COVID-19, we've used extensions of the SIR and the TIV models to try to quantify what immunity looks like. And so here we have extensions for in-host models for the immune response, which we fit to clinical trial data to Pfizer and Moderna. We did the same to AstraZeneca to try to quantify what your protection level will be after vaccination by measuring antibodies and projecting what your T cell immunity will look like, but then trying to quantify what the decay level uh, will be in your antibodies over time to try to understand when a booster dose would be needed, how this is affected by your age, uh, by your sex, and your ethnicity. And then we take that information that we gain from the in-host models on immunity and your change in your, your immune system levels and your protection and to, put, to involve into population level models where we can get distributions of immunity at the population by age. And so I'm not going to go through what all these colors mean, but just generally the, the different shades are the different age groups by 10 years. Green means those individuals are totally protected from infection. Yellow is uh, a moderate level of immunity where you're protected, have a high level of protection against infection. If you do get infected, then you have more likely a mild, a mild infection that you're going to have. Blue is a, a lower level of immunity where you have more susceptibility. And if you're infected, uh, still a higher probability of, of, of a moderate or a severe infection. And in red, we have individuals that are totally susceptible to the disease. And so back a year ago, this is a graph that we generated to look at the immunity distributions in the population in Ontario. And I'll just point out a couple of key concepts here uh, that we're showing. So in red, we see that the, the latest three shades are quite wide. And so that means that we needed to focus on getting higher levels of immunity in age groups zero to 29. But at the time, we didn't have vaccines for the younger age groups. So we had to, so we suggested that there needs to be um, better vaccination campaign and advertising to get people ages 12 to 29 to go out there and get vaccinated. We also see in the blue, the yellow and the green that we have a very big increase in blue. And that means that most of the infections that we're going to have in that wave were going to be mild and would be asymptomatic and would be very hard to measure in the population. In yellow, we have individuals that would show symptoms. I mean, those are moderate infections, and so we would have some of those. But in green, we would see that we see a decay, and that's because immunity was waning faster out of that class than infections were coming in. So we could see that there weren't going to be um, there a lot of severe infections compared to mild and moderate. But when we did look at the severe infections, then we look at the graph on the right, and we could see that in the fall wave of 2021, that 50% of severe infections were going to be in individuals age 50 plus. And so this was, uh, these were some results that we projected in August. And so we were able then to recommend that a booster dose be provided to or offered to everyone age 50 plus right away so that we could minimize the number of severe infections that we would have in the fall 2021 wave. 
So on top of all of these models of the immune response and immunity, mathematics was also able to help um, identify other interesting things during COVID-19. So different patterns and contact rates depending on the public health mitigation strategies that were going on. Um, what public health mitigation strategies would be more effective over time at different times during the pandemic, as well as using um, mathematical models like this to feed into other models uh, that we looked at to look at uh, what demand would be for ward beds and ICU beds uh, weekly, and also how the length of stay in ward and ICU beds would be changing over time, uh, depending on what variant we're even going to be considering that was currently affecting the population. Beyond this, we've started to also think about um, often mathematics now is thought as something that's going to be used to look at the reaction to a pandemic or the reaction of how to roll out a vaccination campaign. But we can also use this, the TIV model and extensions of that to look at um, trying to identify pr appropriate and proper vaccine candidates earlier on in the development pipeline. And so we're starting to work with some pharmaceutical companies to also model the immune response in mice, ferrets, um, macaques, monkeys, and so on, so that we can identify vaccine candidates much earlier in the pipeline that would save money and roll out vaccines and biopharmaceuticals to the population earlier to have maximal effect. So thank you to everyone for listening today. Uh, we're still in an endemic time of COVID-19. And I would just then like to say that uh, I thank the large collaboration group that I have and the many different funding bodies that have supported my work. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.